All right, good to go. All right, everybody, let me welcome you to uh, Sugarland Bible Church live streaming. And as you all know, we're all the churches around the world are in this kind of um, kind of holding pattern where we're having church, but people are staying at home and people are relying upon live streaming. And so we're doing that same thing here. Uh, we're going to be teaching the doctrine of the angels uh, in our first hour. And so let's uh, open our Bibles, if we could, to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, and verses 1 through 4. We are, in this particular study, at the tail end of a lengthy study on the doctrine of angels. Uh, we call this angelology. So we have dealt with the good angels. We've dealt with Satan, and we call that Satanology. We have to deal with Satan because he at one time was a high-ranking angel in the area of angelology. And then from there, we began to look at the beings that fell with him during his initial revolt, and we call that demonology. So we've gone through the Bible and looked at, I think, everything it has to say on demons, Satan, and the good angels. And most people would conclude or they would wrap up the series there, but we're going one step further. We're looking at Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Because what I've tried to explain in uh, prior shows is that Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, also speaks of the subject of the angels. So let's open our Bibles into Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, and let's sort of reorient ourselves as to what these verses say. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 says, Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came to the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of uh, renown. So as we've talked about before, there's some problematic uh, phrases in this passage. Number one, the twofold repetition of the expression sons of God. Who, who are the sons of God? And number two, who exactly are the product of this interface between the sons of God and human women, the Nephilim? And so what we have talked about in this series is there's probably three major views on this. I won't go back through those three views at this point because we've done those in prior shows. But we're focused here on number three, which is what we think is the correct view. The sons of God, we believe, are fallen angels during the flood era just prior to the flood, procreating with human women. Now, why would they do that? Well, they would do that primarily to stop a promise that God made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right after the fall of man, there was a messianic prophecy articulated that there's coming one from the seed of the woman, in this case Eve, who will take the serpent's head and ultimately crush it. And we believe that coming one is none other than Jesus Christ. And we know that this Messiah is coming from the seed of the woman, 
the woman in this case is Eve. And so we have a clear hint, if you will, in the scripture that when the Messiah comes, he's not just going to be fully God, but he's also going to be fully man. And so what Satan is doing in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, according to this angelic interpretation that we're defending here, is he is having some of his demons procreate with human women for the specific purpose of creating a race of people that aren't fully man. Now think about this just for a minute. The Messiah must be fully God and fully man when he comes. He must be from the seed of the woman. And so Satan says to himself at this particular time in history, I'll fix that problem. Uh, I'll create a race of people called the Nephilim, the product of angels or demons procreating with human women who are not fully human, and that way the Messiah can never come. I'll create a hybrid race. I'll so tamper with the genetics of the human race that I'll create a hybrid race of people that are not fully human. And so that is an answer as to why Satan is doing this in history. Now, you'll notice on the chart that I have here on the screen, it says satanic attempts to stop the Messiah. Satan, all the way through the Old Testament, and quite frankly, even into the New Testament, into the life of Christ, made several attempts to prevent the birth of Jesus. Every time he makes that attempt, he changes his strategy just a little bit. And that's how to understand Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. It's just another chapter in a long saga. It's another chapter in a long book, if you will, of Satan trying to prevent the birth of the Messiah. So Satan does this all kinds of times, in all kinds of different ways. And here, he's just altered his strategy some. And in Genesis 6, according to the view that I believe and I'm sharing with you, he's trying to genetically alter humanity. And that's why the beings born from this unholy union are called the Nephilim. Nephilim basically means fallen ones. Uh, It comes from the Hebrew verb nafal, which means to fall. And so he is trying to lock the human race into a permanent state of fallenness through the genetic, genetic manipulation that he's doing here in Genesis 6. So that's the view. The question now becomes, is that really a defensible view? And we have looked at uh, several in several lessons why we think this is a a defensible view. Here's the line of argumentation that we're using. Number one, does the Old Testament teach this view? And you'll remember that we gave you several arguments from Genesis 6 itself that support this view. Probably the most popular argument or the strongest argument is this expression, sons of God which is used two times in <clears throat> excuse me, Genesis 6, <clears throat> is only <clears throat> used three other times in Hebrew Bible. And those other times are in the book of Job, where sons of God always means angels. It can mean good angels, and it can mean fallen angels. And that was the only book in existence, Job being the oldest book of the Bible, that was the only book in existence at the time Moses wrote these words. So when he's using Moses in Genesis 6, Moses, of course, the author of Pentateuch or Torah or the first five books of the Old Testament, when Moses uses the expression sons of God, he's drawing from that literary heritage that we find in the book of Job. Then from there, we moved into the New Testament. And we asked ourselves, does the New Testament comment on Genesis 6? Because your best interpreter of the Old Testament is the New Testament. And there we saw that there are actually three passages that specifically deal with this subject. 
1 Peter 3, verses 19 and 20. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And Jude, verses 6 and 7. And all of those passages talk about how some angels or demons are in a place of incarceration. And the Peter passages especially connect it with the days of Noah. And so what we believe is this. When Satan fell, he deceived a third of the angels into falling with him. Now, some of those fallen angels later on in history, we don't know how many, but certainly a subcategory of the fallen angels, the third that fell, two-thirds, as you can see from this pie chart, remain good angels, unfallen. But of that third, we don't know exactly how many there were that fell, likely a lot. But some of those fallen angels became involved in the sin of Genesis 6. And those are the angels that God took because they left their natural abode and did something particularly heinous. God took them and put them in this place of incarceration. And that's what these three verses here are speaking of. 1 Peter 3, verses 19 and 20, 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, and Jude, verses 6 and 7. And therefore, if you don't have the doctrine of angels in Genesis 6, you have no real explanation as to why some demons now are imprisoned and some are free. Clearly, some are free because we wrestle, Ephesians 6, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. And yet these verses indicate that some are in jail. And it's interesting that particularly the Peter verses connect that jailing with the days of Noah. So we have uh, authority, not just from Genesis 6, but these New Testament passages that all support the angel interpretation. And before I leave that particular point, you might want to slip over to the book of Ephesians for a moment. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And I'm bringing this up now because several people have asked me about this. And they want to know why I am not including Ephesians 4, verses 9 and 10 in my list of three verses dealing with Uh, this issue. Notice what it says. It says, now the expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that also he had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who ascended is himself also he who descended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Now, Backtracking here just for a minute, in the first Peter passage, there is a reference to the fact that Jesus Christ, in between his death and his resurrection, descended to where these fallen demons are who rebelled in the days of Noah in Genesis 6. And he preached or he proclaimed victory over them. And so, since that is a reality, a lot of people want to know why I'm not including Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 as one of my proof texts, because that text indicates that Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth. So, with that being said, let me just offer a brief comment, if I could, on Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And why I do not think Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 is speaking of Jesus' descent into some sort of Hades or maybe hell or some sort of, you know, place of incarceration where the fallen angels are. Let me give you this quote here from Carl Laney. Carl Laney wrote an excellent book called Answers to Tough Questions. Uh, It deals with all of the problem passages, major problem passages in the Bible in a very succinct way. 
Uh, if you don't have this in your library, I would, I would encourage you to get this. But he has a discussion here of, of Ephesians 4, verses 9 and 10. And why Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 is not speaking of Christ's descent into, the, into Hades or into hell or into this place of incarceration where some of the demons now are. Now, 1 Peter is speaking of that. But Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 is not speaking of that, according to Carl Laney. Why is that? And by the way, there's a ton of confusion on Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Why is that? Because in a statement of Christendom called the Apostles' Creed, Uh, What you'll see is a statement that Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth. I think some of the versions of the creed say into Hades or into hell. And so the Apostles' Creed took this as a statement of that descent. But I don't think Ephesians chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 is speaking of that because of what Carl Laney says. So Carl Laney writes as follows, quote, Paul is <clears throat> saying <clears throat> in the context that Christ who went up to heaven in his ascension is the same one who had come down from heaven, commenting on Ephesians 4 verse 10. That descent from heaven occurred when Christ came to the earth and was born as a human. The text refers to the incarnation of Jesus and not a descent into hell. The expression, the lower parts of the earth, and this is very important to understand, is an appositional genitive. This means that the lower parts refer to the earth itself. So when it speaks of Christ's descent into the lower parts of the earth, An appositional genitive is the idea that the lower parts is not something below the earth or something different than the earth or something within the earth, but it's a description of the earth itself. The expression, the lower parts of the earth, is an appositional genitive. This means that the lower parts refers to the earth. And he gives this example. For example, the city of Portland refers to the city which is Portland. The city and Portland are one and the same. So when it says he descended to the lower parts of the earth, an appositional genitive indicates that the lower parts is the same as the earth. Well, why does he call the earth the lower parts? Because it's the opposite from where he came from. He came from a place of glory, majesty on high, and he came to our earth to accomplish his mission of his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. This verse, because lower parts is another description of the earth, appositional genitive, is not saying he went to somewhere other than the earth or some sort of inner cavern within the earth or some sort of trip into Hades or hell, perhaps, in the earth. That's simply not what this passage is saying. So the Apostles' Creed notwithstanding, I don't think you can use Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, as sort of a proof text to describe this doctrine that I'm speaking of here that I do believe is taught in 1 Peter, that Jesus, in between his death and his resurrection descended to where the demons are chained who were involved in the sin of Genesis 6 and he preached or proclaimed victory over them. Yes, that really did happen. That really is supporting data for the angel view, but I would not throw into the mix Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 to help flesh that out. I think the Apostles' Creed has it wrong here because an appositional genitive does not allow that kind of understanding. So that's just a little bit of side noting there in this brief review that we're doing. And I bring these things up because a lot of people ask me these kinds of questions. That's why I try to work them in.
So is the angel view a defensible view? Yes, from the Old Testament, Genesis 6. Yes, from three New Testament passages, not including Ephesians 4, verses 9 and 10, for reasons I've already articulated. And yes, the angel view here, number three, is defensible through tradition. The earliest Jewish tradition that we have supports the angel view of Genesis 6. Beyond that, the earliest Christian tradition amongst the earliest church fathers that we have supports the angelic interpretation of Genesis 6. In fact, we've used this quote here before that the competing view that Genesis 6 is just talking about the, the Sethites and the Cainites intermarrying. It's got nothing to do with angels. That's the main view that competes with the angel view that we have been teaching here. That particular Sethite Cainite view is a view that didn't even come into existence. Most people don't know this, but it didn't even come into existence until a good four centuries. 400 years after the church had started. So the Sethite Cainite view is really not the most traditional view. But the angel view is, both in the church fathers and in Judaism as well. So is the angel view a defensible view? Yes, from the Old Testament. Yes, from the New Testament. Yes, from tradition. And when we run into a theological problem like this, we have to say, well, if you're going to advocate a particular view that's questioned, that's debatable, that's controversial, then there must be objections. And we have to ask ourselves, can these objections be uh, answered? And it is true, there are at least five objections to the angel view of Genesis 6. The first two we've covered, actually perhaps the first three we've covered, and we're going to try to pick up on number four in just a minute, but let me remind you of the objections that we've dealt with. Number one, the first objection is Genesis 6 can't have anything to do with angels because Jesus said in Matthew 22 verse 30 that angels don't marry. So if angels don't marry, how ridiculous is it for you to say Genesis 6 is speaking of cohabitation between angels and humans? But look very carefully at what Jesus says and what he doesn't say. In Matthew 23, verse 30, Jesus says, For in the resurrection they neither, may, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Jesus is not saying here that angels don't procreate. The only statement he's making here is that angels don't marry. Procreation and marriage, obviously, are two different things. And beyond that, Jesus was making a statement here about angels in heaven. <clears throat> he's not speaking of demons, which is what we're dealing with here in Genesis 6. So that objection we discover <clears throat> is really not an objection because to make that objection work, essentially what you have to do is you have to make that verse, Matthew 22 verse 30, say something more expansive than what it's actually saying. The second objection, and we've covered this as well, is the angel view can't be correct because angels, after all, are spirits. And how could a spirit procreate with a human woman in Genesis 6? And so they like to quote Hebrews 1 verse 14, which tells us that angels are ministering spirits. And our response to that is, yes, angels are spirits, generally speaking. But that does not subtract from the fact that they can take on human form. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us very clearly, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, Hebrews 13 verse 2, for by this some, some have entertained angels without knowing it. 
How can people entertain angels without knowing it if an angel can't take on human form? So a spiritual being, yes, they are, but clearly they have a capacity to take on human form. And I've shown you this passage here in Genesis 18, verse 22, which speaks of the men turning towards Sodom. And then in Genesis 19, verse 1, we learn that the men that turned towards Sodom were actually two angels. Angels that actually showed up at the house or the tent, if you will, of Abraham. And Abraham actually gave them, Abraham and Sarah, a meal. So angels in their physical capacity obviously have an ability to eat They have an ability to digest food. I would assume that they have the ability to eliminate waste, etc. And so this idea that Genesis 6, an angelic interpretation of that passage doesn't work because angels are spirits, it, it ignores, that objection ignores all of the biblical data. When you study everything that the Bible has to say on the doctrine of angels, you clearly learn that they are spirits, but they have a capacity to take on human flesh. The third objection, and this is where we were a couple weeks ago, and I'm taking a little while to review, uh, probably because this morning some of you may be new viewers And beyond that, um, we actually didn't meet as a church body last week, so what we've covered is a couple of weeks old. So I hope you'll pardon me as I'm trying to lay the foundation once again. But the third objection is there are Nephilim in the post-flood world. And by the way, to get more treatment on each of these issues, you just go back into our archives and watch them. Here I'm just sort of summarizing what we said. People note that the flood killed every living thing. It says that over and over again in Genesis 7 verses 19 through 23. There were only eight preserved on the ark. And so we believe that the Nephilim or this genetic experiment gone awry that Satan was orchestrating in the pre-flood world, we essentially believe that the Nephilim all perished in the flood. If the Nephilim didn't perish in the flood, then God's purpose for sending the flood was ineffective because he sent the flood specifically not only to judge the world of its sin, but according to the angel view, to destroy this hybrid race that Satan was creating. The problem with the angel view of Genesis 6, as we've described it, is Numbers 13, verse 33, in the days of Joshua, first in the days of Moses and also in the days of Joshua, it says, there also we saw the Nephilim. Numbers 13, verse 33, and it says the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And people say, aha, I thought you told us that all of the Nephilim perished in the flood. And if all of the Nephilim perished in the flood, then did Satan do this a second time? Did he repeat the experiment that he did in Genesis 6 a second time in the days of Moses and in the days of Joshua? So Numbers 13 verse 33 was given at a time when the nation of Israel had passed out of the Red Sea. They had been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. They went down, um, according to our map here, They went down uh, south to Mount Sinai, the tip of the Sinai Peninsula, to receive the Mosaic Law. And then there was basically an 11-day journey from Sinai into the Promised Land. And Deuteronomy chapter 1, when you read it, about verses 2 through 5, right in there, gives you that number of an 11-day journey. They just had to trust God for 11 days, and they would have been in Canaan. So they made their way up north, they got to the southern border of Israel in a place called Kadesh Barnea, they saw giants in the land, they fell into fear, and God closed down that whole generation. 
with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, who entered with the next generation as what we would call seasoned senior citizens, better name for them is seasoned citizens uh, in their 80s. And in the process of seeing the giants in the land, that's where they say, Numbers 13, verse 33, it's there we saw the Nephilim. And so many, many people use Numbers 13, verse 33 to argue that there was a second post-flood angelic eruption. In other words, Satan reduplicated, allegedly, what he tried to produce in Genesis 6. So... You'll notice from the writings of Finnis Jennings Dake, which is a study Bible that a lot of people are drawing from, and they may not know that's where they're getting their information from. But Dake, as far as I know, was one of the first to articulate this second angelic eruption perspective. He writes, there were two eruptions of the fallen angels among men. They produced races of giants on the earth each time. The first eruption was before the flood and the second one was after the flood. And a lot of this thinking comes from the reference to the Nephilim not in Genesis 6, but in Numbers 13, verse 33. Now, I want you to look very carefully at the context of Numbers 13, verse 33, because this is what the second eruption view isn't telling you. <clears throat> the context <clears throat> of Numbers 13, verse 33 is, verse 32, an evil report. A bad report, in other words. Coming from who? Coming from the spies. The spies looked into the land of Canaan from Kadesh Barnea, and they went into fear. And out of fear, they began to articulate the size of their opponents. And in the process, they start using all of these figures of speech to describe their opponents in the land. They say, for example, in verse 32, the land devours its inhabitants. Now, that's obviously a figure of speech. That's what you call a personification. You'll notice also in verse 33, they say, we became like. Like is a simile. We became like grasshoppers in our own sight. Obviously, we don't think the land is actually devouring its inhabitants. There were not grasshoppers in the land. These are personifications or a simile as a fearful report is being brought back to God's people concerning their opponents in the land. And it's in that context these fearful spies use that word Nephilim. So I don't think these spies are actually saying there's Nephilim in the land in the technical sense in the literal sense that we find in Genesis 6, but they're simply in their state of fear analogizing their opponents to the worst thing that they knew of in Jewish history that Moses had written about, which was this Genesis 6 issue. So I think the Genesis 6 Nephilim are very literal, but I think the Nephilim in Numbers 13 are not literal. And quite frankly, the Bible does this a lot. It'll lay down something in a literal sense, like a shepherd, for example. And then it will use later on that shepherd as a metaphor for something. Like the ministry of Christ, the role of a pastor or an elder. So in the second use, it's not saying a literal shepherd. It's using a figure of speech or a metaphor or a simile. And I think that's what's happening with these Nephilim. I don't think what they're seeing in the land is literal Nephilim. I think they're psyched out. They're fearful. They're afraid. And so they analogize their opponents in the host of tons of other figures of speech to the worst thing they could think about in Jewish history. So literal Nephilim, Genesis 6, but they're being used in a metaphorical sense 
in Numbers 13, verse 33. And that's what the two eruption view isn't telling you. The two eruption view is building its theology on this verse, not fully explaining the context of this verse, that this is actually an evil report from the spies that were in emotional turmoil. And one of the things to understand about the Bible, and hear me very carefully on this because it's easy to be misunderstood, the doctrine of inspiration does not guarantee that everything in the Bible is true. Because the Bible records statements of people that said false things. In Genesis 3, for example, Satan lied. He told the woman, you will not die. Well, obviously that's a, not a true statement. So the doctrine of inspiration doesn't guarantee that what the serpent said was accurate. What the doctrine of inspiration guarantees is that the statement actually took place, just like it says. So Numbers 13, verses 32 and 33 is an example just like that. You don't go to a passage like this to build a doctrine. Because when you look at it contextually, it's coming from these 12, I believe there were 12 roughly, <clears throat> intimidated spies who, were analog who are analogizing what they saw in the land to the worst thing they could think of in human history. And I like to quote scholars just to show you that the view that I'm espousing, because most of you may have never heard this, is consistent with what many scholars teach. For example, my professor, Dr. Ronald Allen, who wrote the Numbers Commentary in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, says this of Numbers 13, verses 32 and 33. He calls them the faithless spies who were speaking evil. And then he says the use of the term Nephilim seems to be deliberately provocative of fear, a term un not unlike the concept of boogeymen or hobgoblins. Dr. Allen says by describing themselves as mere grasshoppers in the sight of the faith fabulous Nephilim, they frighten the sandals, I mean, assuming there were sandals back in this day, uh, I assume there were, they frightened the sandals off the people and led a nation to a grievous sin of unbelief against their caring God. Now, it is interesting that the nation of Israel in the time of Joshua enters the land. And they're in that land for 800 years until... They're finally evicted from that land, from the Babylonian captivity about 800 years later. And there's a whole chunk of your Bible dedicated, dedicated to that 800-year time period. The Chronicles books talk about it. The Samuel books talk about it somewhat. And uh, beyond that, you've got Judges. You've got, um, let's see, the King's books. And in all of that history, which covers 800 years, you know what you never see a single time? You never see the word Nephilim again. It's mentioned in Numbers 13, but once they actually get into the land, the word disappears. And that's further evidence that the spies were using the word Nephilim as more or less of a figure of speech. Now, take a look for a minute at Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, because a lot of people try to get mileage out of Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Notice what Dake does to support his two angelic eruptions interpretation. He quotes Genesis 6, verse 4, and it says, There were giants in the earth in those days. Now, you notice what he does here. He puts before the flood in brackets. Why does he have to put that in brackets? Because you don't find that phrase in Genesis 6 verse 4. He's read that into the passage. There were giants in the earth in those days, bracket before the flood, and also after that, notice the second bracket he inserts, after the flood. But the passage doesn't say that. 
look specifically at verse 4. It says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. It never defines what those days are. And it never tells you what afterward is. Now people assume it's after the flood. And if Nephilim were on the earth after the flood, then that would lead, lend support to a second angelic eruption interpretation. But there's an entirely different way of looking at this. When you back up to verse 3 of Genesis 6, God says, My spirit will not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. There is 120 years in existence, at least, that we know of before the flood. 120 years is a long, long time. The United States of America has only been in existence roughly, uh, give or take, 240 years. And so think of a time period that's roughly half the duration of the political life of our entire country. And so when it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, it never defines when when those days are. It could be within that 120-year window, for all we know, prior to the flood. In other words, there's no what we call in Latin terminus a quo given, which is a fancy word for just saying beginning point. It never tells you when those days started and it never tells you what after means. Now people assume it's after the flood, but what I'm trying to explain to you is that is an unwarranted assumption. It could be describing the beginning of some point and after some point within the 120 year uh, window. So what you're seeing is that this second angelic eruption view is built on a lot of evidence that, to my mind, seems somewhat flimsy. And that gets us to our fourth objection. And I was actually going to start the study here with number four, because everything we've done thus far is review, believe it or not, but I think it's review we needed to do. The fourth objection is people say, well, what about the Nephilim in David's day? Notice again the words of Dake as he's trying to find support for his second angelic eruption view. He says the second eruption of fallen angels was evidently smaller in number and more limited in the area. They were, for the most part, confined to the land of Canaan, and their offspring were known as the nations of Canaan. They were known as the Raphaim, the Anakim, Horim, Zanzumim, and other names. They are enumerated in Genesis 15, verses 18 through 21, and many other passages. He goes on and he says, Those were to be utterly destroyed by the sword of Israel, just as the flood had destroyed the ones who had lived in the dispensation of conscience, another way of saying pre-flood. Israel failed in this purpose, so the giants were left to test and prove the chosen people. The giants made trouble for Israel until the time of David, when the last of the races of the giants were killed. So what Dake is doing is he's finding every example of a strange creature in the land of Canaan. During that 800-year window, before the Babylonian captivity whether it's the, any reference to giants, Raphaim, Horim, etc. And he's assuming that those are also references to the Nephilim. Now notice what I said, he's assuming that because the word Nephilim, although it's used in Genesis 6, although it's used in Numbers 13, is not used in any of the passages or people groups that Dake cites. And so a lot of people grab some verses 
which talk about strange creatures in the land, and they assume that those are the Nephilim as a result of the second angelic eruption. They, they like to use this passage here. 2 Samuel 21, verse 20, it says, There was a war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he, and he also had been born to the giant. Now people look at that and they say, there's the Nephilim. I told you there was a second eruption. There it is right there in your Bible. The problem is, do you see the word Nephilim here? They're assuming that's Nephilim. But the text doesn't actually say that. They like to use Deuteronomy 3 and verse 11, which says, For only Og, king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Raphaim. Behold, his bedstead was an iron bed bedstead. It is in Rabbah of the sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits. And its width was four cubits by an ordinary cubit. Now that would be a bed that this entity or this person or creature slept in that was, what, 12, 13 feet long. So people say, there it is. That's the example of Nephilim. But does it say Nephilim? It doesn't say that, does it? They like to use First Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 22 which says, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, mighty indeed, struck down the two sons of Ariel of Moab. He also went down, look at this guy, he killed a lion inside a pit. I like this little detail here, and it happened on a snowy day. I don't know why we have to know it happened on a snowy day, <laughs> but uh, you've got this guy killing this lion in a pit on a snowy day, and people say, obviously, this guy had superhuman strength. There's another example of the Nephilim. There was a second angelic eruption. But notice again that this particular passage does not say Nephilim. Dake and others are assuming it means Nephilim, but assuming something is not the exact same thing as proof. So if there was no second angelic eruption, which is my position, there was one in Genesis 6, but not after the flood, then how do I explain all of these strange creatures? Six fingers and six toes, guy sleeping in a bed that looks like it's about 12 to 13 and a half feet long. Another guy that kills a, a lion on a snowy day. I would simply say this, th those are what we would call abnorm abnormalities of nature. I could take you to the Guinness Book of World Records and I could show you people of abnormal size and of abnormal height. And there are people born today, tragically, with too few fingers or too many fingers. That doesn't make them Nephilim. That's just a genetic normality that you can explain independent of the Nephilim phenomenon. And of course, if you watch in any, any NBA games, uh, I've had the chance in my life, I'm not exactly a short person, stand about six foot six and a half. I've stood next to, in San Antonio, uh, Shaquille O'Neal. We were in a hotel once where they were involved in one of the great series of the NBA of the battle between uh, the Los Angeles Lakers and the San Antonio Spurs, if I remember right, in one of the playoffs, and there was Shaquille O'Neal, so I went and stood right next to him. Gabe, our youth pastor, has stood next to, and he's got a picture of it, uh, Akeem Olajuwon, and my goodness, Gabe doesn't look that tall next to Akeem Olajuwon, and I certainly didn't feel very tall next to Shaquille O'Neal. When I was younger and a Lakers fan, I still am to some extent a Lakers fan, but 
I was really a Lakers fan back in the day. Uh, I went to games and I stood next to uh, one of my heroes growing up, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I felt like a shrimp next to him. So just because there's giants and people that are what I would call freakishly tall, abnormally tall, and I don't know if these guys mind that they're tall, all the millions and millions of dollars that they make in the NBA. I think of Yao Ming, who played here for a number of years in Houston. I think of Ralph Sampson, who also played here in Houston. I mean, I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that they're all Nephilim just because they're genetically different than the rest of us. So that's my explanation for some of these strange creatures in the land. You can explain them without jumping to the conclusion that there was a second angelic eruption. Now, one of the things that Dake uses to support his point is that God commanded that these entities in the land, women and children be completely and totally eradicated. So people say, well, my goodness, if they were eradicated prior to the flood because they were Nephilim, maybe there was a second angelic eruption after the flood, and that's why God similarly commanded all of them to be completely and totally exterminated and eradicated. So notice what Dake says here. And again, he's weaving together proofs for his second angelic eruption view. And what people do when they put these views together is they talk so fast, stringing their points together, that you really don't have time to sit there and back up and examine each point carefully. And so when they string it all together at once, it looks like they're saying something accurate. But we as Christians are called to be Bereans. We're called to sort of slow down and examine each point, point by point. And what I'm saying is none of the points that Dake uses, absolutely none of them are are convincing or proof of anything. Maybe to sort of a fast-talking salesman who knows, who's got the gift of gab and knows how to sling a bunch of ideas together simultaneously, can it sound good? But think of your calling as a Christian. You're supposed to be a Berean. Acts 17, verse 11, you're supposed to examine carefully everything that's taught. That's what the Bereans did with Paul. That's why they were considered more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. And that's what you should do with Dake, and that's what you should do with this live stream this morning. Look at the scripture yourself and see if these things are accurate. But one of the proofs that Dake uses is this. These were to be utterly destroyed by the sword of Israel... Just as the flood destroyed ones that had lived in the dispensation of conscience. So he's using the total eradication of the Canaanites prior to the flood, Genesis 6. And he's trying to compare that to the command that God gave to the Israelites to completely exterminate the giants and so forth in the land. And he's trying to say, well, therefore, if this is true and if this is true, the conclusion is the giants in the land post-flood must be Nephilim as well. And I'm here to tell you that that really is no proof at all. Uh, It is true that God said to Joshua, who entered the land of Canaan, They utterly, as Joshua is acting on the command of God, they utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man, woman, young, and old, and ox, and sheep, and donkey, with the edge of the sword. So the argument is God said eradicate everything to Joshua, God said that same thing concerning, or the flood rather, that same thing concerning the Nephilim, Genesis 6. So therefore, post-flood, those in the land must have been contaminated by some sort of Nephilim virus. That's the argument that's being used. And my point is that that's no proof of anything. Because God, typically in the Bible, and the nation of Israel frequently disobeys God here. 
God typically in the Bible says concerning the enemies of Israel, you've got to completely wipe these people out. You've got to wipe out the women. You've got to wipe out the children. You've got to wipe out the animals. Now, that's not because they're Nephilim. That command in and of itself does not give me the right to see Nephilim in all of these passages when the word Nephilim isn't even used. But God specifically commanded the Jews to do that because he knew that if these people groups were not completely obliterated, and by the way, an an additional study, which we don't have time to get into, they had centuries to repent. So don't think that God gave this command in a nanosecond. There were 120 years, we've learned, before the floodwaters hit. And there were centuries, and there were warnings through the prostitute Rahab and others. I can demonstrate to you that there was a knowledge of Yahweh. I mean, they they knew what was coming. They had an opportunity to repent. And it is true, God said, eradicate all of them, women, children, and animals. And the reason God said that is not because they were Nephilim. He said that because if you allow them to live in any sense, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The little kids that are pagans and idolaters are going to grow up to be pagans and idolaters. And if you allow this people group to live, the nation of Israel, God's special nation, God's redeemed nation, is going to follow their pattern of living and is going to become idolatrous just like these people groups were idolaters and my goodness had is because Israel didn't do exactly what God said isn't it interesting in biblical history how the nation of Israel goes into captivity and the northern tribes are scattered because they started to imitate the detestable practices of those within the land. Now, before you sit in judgment on the Israelis, uh, what sin is in your life (laughs) and my life where God says, deal with this? And we put it off and we think we can contain it without eradicating it under his power. And what we discover in the course of time is that the sin ultimately controls us rather than the other way around. That's why God gave these commands, not because they were Nephilim. And so you see these types of commands later on in biblical history. This is what God said to Saul. This is why Saul lost his empire. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman and child and infant and ox and sheep and camel and donkey. That doesn't give me a right to read Nephilim into this. It's get rid of these idolaters or you're going to imitate their practices. And of course, Saul didn't do that. He did it partially partial obedience and that's how he lost his kingdom and you go all the way into the time of Daniel into the time of Babylon into the sixth century did you watch what God did to those that persecuted Daniel and threw him into the lion's den it says then the king gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them look at this their children their wives into the lion's den, they, that's those cast into the den, had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Now, there's another uh, example in the Bible where there's an eradication of even the children and the wives. Now, that took place in Babylon. 350 miles to the east of the nation of Israel in modern-day Iraq, a land called Shinar. You'll see that geographical location given in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. So if everywhere there's a total eradication of a people group, I'm allowed to read Nephilim into that passage, then I guess I have to believe that Nephilim weren't just in the land of Israel. <laughs> 
somehow these Nephilim made it all the way to Babylon. So my point is, none of these arguments that Dake and others raise is that convincing. So the next time we're together, I want to deal with this fifth and final objection. And that objection is this. If the angel view of Genesis 6 is true, then could that sin be replicated today? Because that's what many, many conferences are teaching and they're packing out auditoriums convinced, trying to convince people of this. The Nephilim are going to come back. The angelic incursion is going to come back. Because after all, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. So we'll deal with that objection next time. But our main point today is the objections to the angel view of Genesis 6 don't carry a lot of weight, including this objection that there was somehow Nephilim in David's day and beyond, thanks to a second eruption. There was no second eruption. The eruption that we're speaking of was a one-time event in biblical history. It was unique. Satan was doing something specific during that time. Following that time period, following the flood, his strategy changed. Same goal. But the strategy is different, and there's nothing in the life of David or these strange creatures that indicate that the Nephilim somehow were the product of a second eruption. I'm going to close this in a word of prayer, and I hope you'll join us at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time as we are, Lord willing, going to try to complete the book of Revelation. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're grateful for your truth and things in your word that, we, that don't get taught on much, but we need to get an accurate understanding so we're not drawn into sensationalism. So help us to be good stewards of these areas of your word as well. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen.